I am so excited to come back live on the Daily Oil broadcast. My name is Simon Olatuji. It is my pleasure that all over the world, friends and listeners are reaching back to me, asking lots of questions. Now I know, now I know, I have no doubt as to why God in his sovereignty has laid it in my heart to treat this topic of tithe and tithing and whatever happens to it. In the church today, there are lots and lots and lots of teachings flying around the place. Things that people teach, things that people say, things that people hold, things that people believe, which they who teach, they who are being taught, they who hold those teachings do not really understand the context and the content of what they are teaching, they are being taught, what they believe, or what they hold. And there are lots of things, air of doctrine, blowing across the face of the church, all over the world. Because today alone, I have received phone calls, emails, text message on my regular on my whatsapp i've received bbm message and i have also received lots of facebook messenger uh, message that people are sending in to let me know maybe their questions their arguments their doubt their confusion their position on this issue of tight but it goes to show that the, the body of Christ have got a whole lot to do in retracing real biblical tenets, real biblical teaching and doctrine. It's not about what somebody said. It's not about an opinion that I had my pastor say. I trust my pastor. So what he says is QED. That is not about it. The word of God, and that is why when that man stood before Jesus, and Jesus said, okay, what does the law say? And he says, the law says, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do this. And Jesus said, well, that is what the scripture says, but how do you understand it? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? I want you to know, gentlemen and ladies, that the word of God was written in a particular system, in a particular context, having a certain meaning and import to the original recipient, to the original people that received the revelation immediately. Now, it has implication and application of all time. The word of God is forever relevant. And that is why I keep emphasizing the part of the scripture that says, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now, today, I want us to get back to the actual sense of retracing this ancient landmark of tithing. And I want to say a prayer. And after I say a prayer, I'm going to pray. And then I get back to the teaching. Oh Lord God of heaven, we trust you, your wisdom, your counsel, your understanding. We ask you that you will shed the light in our darkened heart. So that at the end of this broadcast today, there will be no doubt that we had, that you have blessed us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. People of God, I want to read from Matthew chapter 19 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 22. What do I have to do in order to live forever with God in heaven? What do I have to do in order to live forever with God in heaven? Gentlemen and ladies, this question was asked by a very rich young man. The Bible called him a rich young ruler who came to the Lord Jesus Christ 
and was trying to patronize him. He's a good master. Now, when Jesus saw that man, the Bible said at first, when Jesus saw him, when Jesus looked upon him, Jesus loved him and gave him an unusual answer, an answer that no, none of us will expect. When Jesus, first of all, addressed the patronage, Jesus, first of all, addressed and correct the assumption that in us, when it comes to us, when it comes to man, no man is good. In our eagerness and drive to reach God and live with God forever and serve God with all our faithfulness and be acceptable to Him, there is nothing in us, by us, with us, through us, about us, that qualifies us to reach God. No, not our tithe. No, not our sacrifices. No, not the strongest service done by any man. So, now, the issue of tithing is not about the legality and the certificate or the visa for heaven. No. No. Somebody can pay all the tithe of all the things of this world without being connected to the grace of Jesus Christ and being one of his. Go to hell. Somebody can, can give all that he has to the poor without the love of God ruling in the heart of that person. The person has missed it. We lose out of the blessing, the ultimate blessing, eternal glory, eternal hope with God. The person will be the loser. So now, when that man came to Jesus and asked him, good man, good master, what do I have to do in order to live forever? Now, don't forget that in the culture where Jesus Christ lived, in the culture that was the mixture of the Greek culture and the mixture of the Hebraic culture, because at the time that Jesus Christ came, the Greco-Roman world had already conquered all the then known world. The spirit of Hellenism was already spreading. Now, the, the culture of the Greek was like they were seeking wisdom as a means of reaching God. Some of them were worshipping other gods as a means of reaching God. The ultimate question in the heart of everybody in those days was, how do I do? What do I do to, uh, to attain to the highest goal? To reach God? To live eternally? So that was the common quest of everybody. So now, there was a conclusion in the heart of people, generally, in the days of Jesus, that doing enough good being a good man, being a good person, doing enough good was a means, a certificate, a, a kind of legal tender. Something that you tender before God that see all my good works, see how kind I am, see how much I pay to church, see how much I have in my tight account of the ministry, see how much I have built the, the church, see what I have done. Now, that was the posture with which this young, rich ruler approached Jesus. And that was why he quickly called him good master. And that was at the back of the Lord when he, he, he quickly corrected that erroneous presupposition that except a man be good, he cannot see God, or except somebody is good, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So Jesus said, no man in himself, he is not saying I am bad, he is not saying I am not a good man, but as a representation of what is good, as a pointer to the expectation of God, no man is good. So now, if we relate this directly to the concept of tithing, because some people are already seeing legality involved in tithing. If it were a case of legality, there is no amount of tithe that you can use or you can pay that will buy salvation, that will incur the mercy 
of God rather than the wrath of God. So there are so many people living in sin and they are paying tight. They are not born again. But they think that by giving all that they have to the poor, by paying all their tithe, by giving offering, they think that by so doing, they inherit the kingdom of God. But no, no, it's not possible. So now, when Jesus was addressing these people, he was addressing the people that already had the consciousness that being good is what takes you to heaven. In another sense, by the time Moses was given law, the nation of Israel have not evolved the consciousness of their goodness. They were living in their ignorance, living in sin, wicked, very, very stubborn-hearted. They will not give to God that which is due him. They will not honor their parents. They will not honor their mother and father. They will not, you know, give to God what is due him. They will not serve him when they are supposed to serve him. They will rob their neighbor and steal from him. They are going to sleep with their neighbor's wife and do all kinds of things. And it was very necessary in those old tabernacles for things that should have been ordinary act of service as a demonstration of love and passion towards God. Things that ordinarily a believer in God will do. That was I mean, typical of Abraham who was willing to even sacrifice his son. That was typical of Isaac who was willing to sacrifice his labor, his effort. When they, they fought with him over his, his wealth, he gave them up. That was a demonstration of his love for God and desire to live peaceable life. But you know, at the time the law was given, the people of Israel were stiff naked. They would not do nothing. So, things that Abraham did naturally as a demonstration of law and covenant relationship with God, that Jacob did naturally as a demonstration of his increasing, expanding, ever enlarging relationship and friendship with God, now became a matter inscribed in law for people to show their love for God. And that is when tithing came into the Mosaic law. For God to place demand on men and women everywhere to demonstrate their love for the God that they claim they serve. That is when legality is involved. But now, let me show you something that really, really fascinated me in the Old, I mean, in the New Testament. When Jesus came, the people were already settled when it comes to the matter of law. No Jew to whom Jesus ministered directly will joke with anything when it comes to payment of tithe. When it comes to, you remember the two people that came to the temple, the story that Jesus Christ told. That one was beating his chest and will not even lift up his eyes to heaven and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When they sinned in the days of Jesus, they quickly repented before God and were ready to make amends. In the same way, an average Jew before the Lord will boast of his religion, will boast of his faithfulness, because they pay tight, they give alms, they keep law, they are careful, they worship God, they give all that they needed to give before God. So it was not a necessary key matter to be treated in the days of Jesus. Every Jew knew what to do. It was not important. It was not important. So that was why to the Lord, the concept of tithing was condemned by the Pharisees whom Jesus were approaching when he says, you emphasize the many matters and you condemn the major. You ignore the major. You play down on the major. Now, that is talking to us gentlemen and ladies that God cares 
about how our love is demonstrated to him, whether in material or in economic or in career or in family that is matrimonial or in ministry. Whatever we do, the intent of God, why he is particular about giving him the first place in our resources, is God always wants to be number one. And I have emphasized this enough. And I will come back to that scripture in the book of Matthew, I mean Mark chapter 10, verse number 21. When the Bible tells us that Jesus looked on the man and told him, keep the commandment. Don't kill, don't steal, don't, don't lie, honor your parents. Then the young man told Jesus that he has been keeping all this rule since he was a child. At this point, do you think that this man saw the need for God? The man that said, I've been keeping all this rule. I've been paying tithe. I've been giving an offering. I've been keeping all these rules. An average Jew paid tithe. Now, Jesus Christ, even though the Bible did not emphasize or say for sure any particular time when he went to church and he paid his tithe, but Jesus Christ, I bet you, was a good Jew. He was a Jew. And as a Jew, he was presented at the synagogue. Whatever needed to be done over him was done at Chaipa. As he grew, he demonstrated his learning of the Torah. When he sat, when it, he was 12, with the chief tax collectors, the Sahindrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all of them there in the synagogue, and he stood with authority and he taught them from law and Moses. That is on the one hand. After the resurrection of our Lord, on his way to Emmaus, the Bible says he expanded all that was said in the laws and the prophets to them. That was talking about a resurrected Lord. Whom many of you today or many of us in the body of Christ claim abrogates the law. We claim that our Lord condemns the law. But even after his resurrection, on the way to Emmaus, with the two believers, one named Cleopas, the other unnamed, the Bible tells us that Jesus expanded the laws and the prophet to them. Somebody picked me up two days ago and said, what do I mean? By Jesus Christ has come to fulfill the law. In other words, that Jesus Christ has come to close the chapter of the law. So somebody that fulfills something closes that chapter. In other words, the essence of Jesus Christ, the essence of Jesus Christ is that he is the apex, the fulfillment, the consummation of everything that the law stands for. That is what it means. So now, this man, when he came to Jesus, he did not even demonstrate his need for God. We hold tight to our possession and we are not willing to let go. We hold tight to our consciousness. Everybody is fighting. We cannot, we should not pay tight because it is difficult for a great majority of people in our world to see God as the ultimate owner of everything. And when he owns everything, I should be willing to give him a token. That's a parameter of a child. I was demonstrating in three episodes a way that when you give a child piece of cake with the right hand and you give another with the left hand, he grabs both with his both hand, he has a mouthful of cake, and when you stretch forth your hand and give me, he says, mm -mm. he's not willing to give. So the problem with that man and why he went away before the Lord, sorrowful and sad, is because he could not pin God and the need for God and the fact that God owns everything in all that he has got. Gentlemen and ladies, men of the New Testament, born again believers, Christians, people of God, saved, born again. Anywhere you are, no matter your denomination, no matter your color, no matter your culture, I want to ask you a question, direct question put to you. Who owns everything? Who owns it? Is it not God? Now, 
if the Bible tells you that give a tenth of what belongs to God back to him in recognition that he owns all and because you just don't want to do it you claim that belongs to the old order whereas all the blessings and all the promises and all the prophecies of the old orders are still used by the New Testament church we claim the promises of Isaiah that behold I make all things new we claim the promises arise and shine for your light has come we claim the promises the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want all those belong to the prophecies and revelation of the Old Testament covenant which by the authority of the scripture continues to hold the scripture can never be abrogated the scripture can never be obsolete the word of God is on dying revelation of God for his people. The activities of God in the Old Testament, in fact, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was the pillar in the cloud. Jesus Christ is the manna that followed them in the wilderness. Jesus Christ is the, is the living water that followed them. And Jesus Christ, of course, is the fulfillment of the law. Gentlemen and ladies, let me show you the reason this rich young ruler went away saddened in his heart. I have said, number one, he did not see his need for God. He saw religion. So those of you who hold the content, the concept of tithe as a religion, you miss it. Whether you are paying tithe or you are a non-payer of tithe, so long as you are walking in religion, you miss relationship. You miss relationship. So this is not religion. This is not religion at all. Now, the young ruler asks Jesus if there is anything he should do else, anything else. And Jesus said to him, because Jesus saw that behind his question, is a self-aggrandized fellow, self-righteous fellow, self-elated fellow who thought that by doing works of righteousness, he can appeal God and appease him and enter into his eternal rest. And Jesus said, go sell everything that you own and give the money to the poor. Then now the rich man had that. That's a commandment that I could not keep. That's a commandment that I could not keep. Go sell everything that you have and give to the poor. Now, I have a question. Do you think that that itself is a commandment to you? It's in the New Testament. Jesus said it. This word came as an imperative. I looked at it from the original scripture, original language with which Jesus spoke to that man. He spoke in imperative voice, active voice, and he spoke in the present. It's a present continuous tense that was in the active voice with an imperative tone. Jesus said, go, sell all that you have, give to the poor. So now, ask me, why are we not in the New Testament time who believe Jesus and follow him, not willing to go sell everything we have and give to the poor and go live under the bridge? Why? Now, the problem with us is that we do not understand the scripture in context. And until you understand the word of God in context, there will be a lot of confusion. Now, you will say, okay, Jesus was not talking to me, he was talking to the man. When he said, bless Adam, that is the only time he's talking to me. When he says, I have given you the keys of the kingdom. That is the only time he's talking to me. 
Whereas he was talking to Peter. I'm not saying that doesn't apply to you. I'm not saying that doesn't apply to me. But how do you understand the scripture? That is the essence of today's episode of our retracing the blind mark of Titan. We are not to sit on armchair and make up our mind that this is what I think. What does the scripture say? That is the authority of any believer. That is the authority of the church. That is the ingredient that God is looking for when you stand before him. He wants to see how obedient you are to the word that he gave to you. So this man went away sad because he couldn't keep it. The issue here is, is God number one in the life of that man? Whether it was a payer of tithe or a non-payer of tithe. Whether he was a giver of all or he was a non-giver of all. Was God number one in his life? The same is applicable to the history, to the story of that man. The rich fool. Now, the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. That says... The grand as you then. This is what I will do. I will tear down my bars and build bigger ones. And there I will store up grains. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grains. Laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, that is the nature of man. We refuse to see God as number one. That he is the owner of all things. And everything we own goes to him, comes from him, and we will not take anything with us by the time we are leaving this place. So if this were true, people of God, how do you treat your possession as belonging to God? And if yes, are you willing to give to God what the Bible requires? If no, why? Then the question comes, is God number one in your life? Do you see your need for God and past after him? People of God, this is not about legality. This is not about what you do or what you don't do. I want you to know that God desires your service, your heart, and your love. He wants you to show him that you love him indeed. You have need for him regardless of your riches or poverty. And he is number one in your life. That is the essence of tithing. That is why God requires that before you jump into enjoyment of your affluence, of your income, of your earnings, of your property, God desires that you will highlight that portion of scripture that says, give unto me a tithe of all you have got. And you set it aside and give it unto him. I want to close today. But I will not until I have shown you something that is very crucial for us New Testament believers. Jesus said, Blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. Fasting and hungering after righteousness is our requirement. If not, nobody will be qualified. Jesus Christ did not even say, blessed are those who have attained the end or the benchmark of righteousness. Of course, he makes a very clement, very kind, very easy to attain standard for all of us. Only if we love him and thirst for him. Do you thirst for God? The fury and fuse and noise and all kinds of things going on around town as to what we give to God, what we don't, how we love God, how we do not, are only boiling down to the fact that ours is a generation that thirst after something else. Our thirst is not on the word of God anymore. We are so comfortable to let other people read the word of God for us and tell us whatever they come up with. We are so comfortable with it. 
Our task is no more a personal study of the word of God until we come to a conviction that this is the revelation. This is what the scripture is saying. We sit on Ham's chair and listen to the winds of doctrine that is blowing across the place. I believe that. No, that is right. I believe that as long as it matches with the nature of our heart. As long as it stamps the wicked disobedience of our heart. We no longer task for righteousness. We no longer task for the undying word of God. The generation needs God today and we must return to God. I want us to pray. I want you to ask God to help you. I want you to ask God, come to him with a sincere motive, not like that rich young ruler who came to Jesus Christ to bribe his way to reach God in a way of patronage. I want you to ask God to help you so that my heart, my thirst, my desire, my righteous pursuit will be you and you alone in all that I have. Whatever I do not have, whatever I have, my pursuit will be you and you alone and nothing more but you. Whatever I have, all belongs to you. The Bible says no one receives a thing except it is given him from above. I want to pray with somebody. You want to ask God that all that I have belongs to you. All that I have belongs to you. I want to understand more of you. Let your Holy Spirit help me. Let your Holy Spirit help me to die to this self so much so that I am willing to give all that the, the word of God requires me to do in order to live a faithful steward of everything that God has given unto me. Father, thank you for today. I pray for that brother, for that sister, for that listener today who is willing to return to your word and seek the truth and not fables. I want you to help that brother, that sister. I want you to give strength to your word in his heart so that they will come to the knowledge of the truth and pursue it with every detail. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. People of God, on the screen, I am very sure on my page, I am very sure. You must have seen my email, my phone number, and every other means by which you can reach me. Let me know how you are doing. Let me know how this is doing. I want you to reach out to me in any form. A question, contribution, you have some things agitating your mind. I want you to reach me. My name is Simon Olatuji. I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Now, that brother that spoke with me earlier today was concerned that the Bible says all things have become new. The old is past and everything has become new. Of course, you are a new creature when you come to Jesus Christ. But the old order that the Bible is talking about is the order of sin. The old order that is gone is the order of your flesh, the carnality in you. And it's not as if you are completely dead to the carnal life. Because believer has two natures. The nature of God and the Adamic nature. The nature of Jesus Christ is the nature that you allow when you yield yourself to the word of God. You obey the spirit promptings and you live a righteous life. The, the nature of Jesus Christ is fully formed in you as you grow daily in your union with Christ Jesus. Those of you whose heart is to grow in union with Christ, I pray for you that God will help you that every day, every day, your eagerness, your love for God will mature into more godliness, into more righteousness, so that you will know him more, you will love him more, and you will serve him more. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Once again, my name is Simon Olatuji, and this is Daily Oil. God bless you. Have a great day.